you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, thank you for um, your warm introduction. Can I add my thanks uh, for the hospitality to Christchurch and to thank the William Temple Foundation for their invitation to deliver their annual lecture this year. Um, I'm delighted to be associated with the ongoing work of the Foundation. And so I hope that those of you for whom this event is your first contact with the Foundation, that it won't be your last. Um, and that you will be encouraged by this evening to engage further. Uh, what I want to share with you this evening is part of a continuing exploration for me. Um, so thank you all for wanting to be here and to join in this conversation with me. So, gender and sustainable transformation. Exploring the difference women make. I want to take this opportunity to open up the conversation about sustainable transformation, by which I mean change for good that will last, which for me is the kingdom of God coming near. My own experience of exclusion and influence, my observation of those on the margins discerning and using their own capacities to be the change that they want to see, my reflection on scripture and the wisdom of others, brings me to suggest that sustainable transformation Indeed, the kingdom of God is near, in and from the margins. So that's the premise I'm working from. Sustainable transformation is found in and from the margins. Because it seems to me that God works there to usher in the kingdom. This, I think, is, in part at least, what bishops are for. Drawing attention to the kingdom and how near it is. Seeking the kingdom and allowing the kingdom to be within us and to change us. Working to enable the kingdom to be seen and heard and received by others. And trying not to get in its way. And that's quite difficult. If I'm coming to the conclusion that the kingdom of God is near in and from the margins, because bishops, even women bishops, are at the centre of things. And so I think in perpetual danger of misusing, abusing even, our power and control. So though I am a woman, I don't think I'm on the margins of my community and society. I am a well-educated, white, middle-class woman, recently entrusted with senior leadership in the church. And I don't want to collude with the misuse of power and be seduced by its idols. Our common human experience, though, reveals just that tendency towards the abuse of power, the imposition of control, the desire for self-determination. And this evening I'm discussing gender and sustainable transformation because although all sorts of demographics are at different times and in different places marginalised, too often it is the women and girls among them who are at the very edges. So if we are to talk about sustainable transformation, about change for good that will last, we also, I think, have to talk about gender and the powers that keep millions of women, though not exclusively women, on the margins. 
I do acknowledge that we, in the 21st century West at least, do live in a world where power sometimes is held by women, by women like me in the church, by women like Angela Merkel, Theresa May, Hillary Clinton, perhaps, and others in politics. We see Janet Yellen, Christiane Lagarde, Anna Patricia Botan, for example, in finance. We see Cheryl Sandberg, Susan Wachke, Meg Whitman, you may be able to identify others in technology. And yet, as the charity Christian Aid claims, in the 21st century, poverty still has a woman's face. Women to different degrees in different countries are not only poor, but marginalised, disenfranchised, commoditized. That's to say a woman's very identity can be taken, made into an object capable of being exploited, sold and resold, humiliated, made invisible, according to the needs of overwhelming power. So let's imagine for a moment. What would sustainable transformation look like for the women who are trapped in grinding poverty with less than two dollars a day to feed their families? What would sustainable transformation look like for those who are kidnapped, trafficked across continents to work in prostitution, or for those subjected to constant beatings? What would sustainable transformation look like for women who are ruled by rape, whether as an instrument of war or as a tactic to lower or avoid bride price? I'm not ignoring the marginalisation of men. And I'm not suggesting that the presence of some women at the top tables in global power and influence heralds a new dawn of gender equilibrium, though I delight that they are finally there. But I think gender justice, social justice, economic justice are inseparable. And I want to contend that the sustainable transformation to move towards them will come from within the margins of the lived experience of gender, social, economic and other injustice. This thinking about sustainable transformation is not new territor territory for me but it has been mapped out for me more thoroughly recently. The significant experience in my exploration of what sustainable transformation might look like was my participation in an immersion training visit to Kerala, South India in 2014. Um, this section of my lecture, I just have to point out, has not been um, previously seen by John, who was instrumental in um, organising the visit. Uh, this visit was organised by Christian Aid and its local partners for eight senior Church of England clergywomen. What has proved most valuable for me from that visit is reflecting on the embodiment I saw of the principle that the view from those on the inside is essential for the work of transformation. It was really good to see that principle of partnership, which is Christian Aid's way of working, lived out. And to see how this is a good way, perhaps indeed the only way, to achieve permanent change. Because transformation cannot, it seems, be imposed from the outside. That immersion includes staying in pairs in the homes of tribal families among the most marginalised in Indian society to be alongside the women who gave us hospitality. And from that context, 
to visit groups of other women who had come together to change their lives. So, for example, we met a group of paddy field workers who had formed a cooperative to purchase machinery, access training and begin collective bargaining with landowners for whom they worked to ensure they had reliable, regular income. I've reflected a lot since that trip about power and where it lies. The real power to change lay with those on the inside, not with those who looked the most powerful from the outside. This wasn't something I discovered for the first time in Kerala, but I did see it there embodied very powerfully and very movingly. That experience of immersion was one in which we, living in a different context from our own, albeit briefly, experienced genuine vulnerability. And that experience of immersion was something essential in shaping my engagement then and my practice since. I recognise that giving space and power to others doesn't diminish me. The experience taught me not to be anxious about letting go of power or status, but rather to embrace that letting go and in it to feel entirely secure in my dependence on others. I remember a particular conversation towards the end of our stay with our families when, through our translators, we were discussing future hopes. I was trying really hard as I'd been taught, not to ask leading questions. So I asked what one thing they would change if they could do anything to make life better. And the family struggled to find an answer. They had clean water now, thanks to their work with the Christian aid partner who'd set up our contact with them. Their children had access to education. Those were the things they'd hoped for. And now they had them, they struggled to identify anything further. So I wondered aloud if electricity might be a good development. We had been aware how carefully they had managed the food they had prepared for us each day. Other than rice, Everything they had was prepared and eaten the day they acquired it. In that heat, nothing fresh could be kept from one day to the next. If you had electricity, you could have a fridge, I suggested. And I was surprised how adamantly they dismissed that. A fridge would be detrimental, not beneficial, they said. Well, in my arrogance, I assumed that that response was lack of imagination or a resistance to what I could see was clearly progress. If only they understood better what a difference a fridge would make to their ability to budget, to a healthy diet, to their hygiene, They explained. They knew villages which had received electricity and some household had purchased fridges. The change that brought was immeasurably damaging, they thought. In their own village, when anyone had food, they prepared it and shared it. No one ever went entirely hungry because anyone could eat what was available. Everyone knew that some days they would have more than they needed and others could share their plenty. And on days when they didn't have enough, someone else would have extra. Everyone was generous because there was no point in keeping anything in reserve. But once household had fridges, they began to hoard 
to keep extra for themselves for tomorrow in case they ran out. People began to try to become self-sufficient even though they knew it meant that others would sometimes go hungry. They began to live out of fear, responding to limited resources by hoarding. They became selfish and in the end greedy. My hosts did not see that as making life better. It was a valuable lesson for me. My hosts understood what was good for them much better than I did. Of course they did. My outside assumptions would not enable change for good. My impositions would not bring sustainable transformation. The kingdom of God was very near to them in their mutual dependence. And I almost missed it. But such experiences cannot be the whole story for me. I need to be comfortable that there's good theological basis in forming the continuing process of struggle against marginalisation, poverty, inequality and violence that are faced disproportionately by women. Although our genderedness is undoubtedly sometimes a source of control and the abuse of power, I don't think that's the way humanity is intended or the way it has to be. And it's not a solution for women to take power away from men. And it's not simply that men need to change. We need perhaps to go back to the beginning because I think the experience of women demands a radical reimagining of us all a reimagining that helps us to look afresh today by taking us back to the very start, perhaps. I read that the creation story reveals our humanity to come out of generosity and mutuality. I'm assuming that the term Adam, as used in the creation accounts, is a ge generic term for human beings rather than a proper noun. If Adam does not mean maleness, I wonder what difference it makes for all of us to live as Adam, complete and secure in diversity and variety. To read, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. I'm reading the creation narratives as illustrating mutuality and interdependence. I want to suggest that our difference is a strength that requires us to be together, side by side, face to face. I read that Adam is intended as whole in our shared maleness and femaleness. We are Im imaging God together. Male and female together bearing the image of God. It is the together indifference that echoes the image of God, the God who is one in perpetual communion. Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The story of the fall, though, recognises our common experience of failing to live up to that potential. That narrative gives voice to the seeking after self-determination and self-sufficiency that moves us from the centre to the margin of God's creation. And with that marginalisation comes loss of mutuality. Divergence rather than healthy difference. Instead of living trustingly, we experience blame and guilt. We sense deficiency and lack instead of security. We succumb to the false idols of self-determination requiring the subjugation of other 
a warping of desire, an abuse of power. My conviction, nonetheless, is that while this marginalisation pre presents a problem, it is also a place from which solutions come. Because it is where God chooses to be with us still. So I also read the creation stories as they form part of a bigger narrative in which being fruitful and multiplying remains the direction of travel, in which God's purposes are not thwarted and the currents of salvation history are not stilled. So I've been considering the continuing biblical threads of creation that lead through Sabbath, Jubilee and Exodus into incarnation, the cross and resurrection. And in reading the narratives of God at work in these unexpected places and through the examples of those discovering and revealing God in the margins, I think we can discover that the kingdom of God has come near. I want to reflect on just a couple of stories from the Bible to illustrate the extraordinary possibility and promise that God chooses to make evident in the margins of our lived experience. Stories of women on the edge who have recognised God in the generous spaces still to be discovered there. They are stories of gleaners. Those who find provision in the corners of life that God requires his people, even in the midst of our hoarding, to leave for the work of transformation to happen. The first is the story of Ruth and Naomi. Women marginalised by gender, ethnicity, age, bereavement, into material poverty. They were not, however, <coughs> helpless or useless. They shared a life, giving mutuality, identity and resource to one another and they were able to make use of such assets they had. Out of what they had, which in the eyes of the world was destitution, they were able to work together for change for good. Further, the story of Ruth and Naomi, Naomi teaches me that sustainable transformation from the margins is possible not just for individuals, but is where God chooses to work for the good of us all. The book of Ruth isn't the story just of individual salvation. It's a story of the salvation of us all. My second illustrative account is that of the Syrophoenician woman who came to Jesus on behalf of her daughter. In the world of the New Testament, would seem unusual that a woman would come to Jesus herself rather than a man on her behalf. Perhaps for whatever reason she was raising her child alone. And it's clear from Jesus' initial response to her that she is right on the margins of his society. A Gentile, a foreigner and a woman. A dog. But she, like Naomi and Ruth, out of boldness or desperation, made use of the assets she had. She made good use of the crumbs available to her. And it seems that in her, even Jesus was made to recognise and respond to God at work, in margins even further out than his own. These are biblical examples of the experience of women facing real problems and finding voice and agency from the margins. We live in a world today too where there are women in all walks of life who bring about sustainable transformation. In them and through them too, the kingdom of God is brought near. I'd like to mention just a couple of initiatives I'm aware of that seem to me to reflect this. Cash is a Pakistan-based microfinance organisation 
which, when it was founded, lent exclusively to women in groups of 25. Its members guaranteed one another's debts. They meet every two weeks to make payments and discuss social issues. What's wonderful about this project is that it now lends to what it calls bottom of the pyramid families, including men. Its mission statement is financial services for all in a poverty free and gender equitable society. I'd also like to mention the Afghan Institute of Learning. Aid campaigns in Afghanistan mostly focused on towns rather than the countryside. And the perception of outside aid workers is often threatening. However, significant change has come from grassroots. Dr. Shakina Yakubi, founder and director of the Institute, says that this project is an Afghan organisation run mainly by women that seeks to help all Afghanis rebuild their lives and society through transformation at the individual and community level. The work of the Institute began with secret schools under the Taliban and now provides education, healthcare and legal services for 350,000 women and children in Afghanistan. It has 480 staff, 80% of whom are women. Closer to home, I've seen for myself a glimpse of these possibilities and discerned the nearness of the Kingdom of God in my contact with Style Prison. I'm going to talk about some of the extraordinarily good work that goes on in Style. But I can't do that today without making reference um, to the news that Celeste Craig, aged 26, was found dead in her cell in style this past weekend. And so as we meet today, I want to remember her and her family and friends and the staff at Style Prison. The education and training, the rehabilitative and restorative justice work that goes on, including through the chaplaincy in style, is inspirational. This is especially the case when the women prisoners are able to shape and contribute themselves to programmes. The Clink restaurant, for example, is designed to transform the lives of the women through work-based training and education. The women working in the restaurant are training for recognised qualifications and are mentored before and after their release to help to find employment within the hospitality industry. The Clink project runs in four prisons, men's and women's, and has an 87% success rate in preventing re-offending. Of course, this is not just about women. For it's not only women who are on the margins, and it's not only women who can be agents for transformation. I've seen this in my association with the Children's Society. One of the reasons I wanted to work with the Society is the sector-leading approach they have to the inclusion and participation of the children we work with in shaping policy and practice. And this approach is something I find now challenges my own practice elsewhere. The young people who inevitably, given the nature of the Children's Society's work, have experienced some of the most marginalising circumstances you can possibly imagine, are involved with genuine influence, right up to playing a direct part in the recruitment of senior staff and trustees. Being interviewed by the young people on the trustee board as part of my recruitment process was rigorous, let me tell you. <laughs> what I'm trying to illustrate is my premise that truly sustainable transformation comes from these margins. I'd like to give a quick mention to the current campaign initiated by Rachel Treweek. Uh, Bishop of Gloucester, called Lidentity, 
which is encouraging young people, especially girls, to expose the lie that our identity is determined by our appearance. Rachel's initiative was triggered by finding in the Children's Society Good Childhood Report about adolescent well-being or lack of it, especially among girls in this country. Lie identity is another example of engagement that's likely to lead, I think, to sustainable transformation because it is responding to those who want change, who are otherwise excluded, marginalised, commodified, by giving them voice and agency to effect the change they look for themselves. So sustainable transformation regarding, say, the empowerment of women, and sexual exploitation in this violence, is more likely to come about through the work of Changing Lives, a recent peer-led research project into so-called survival sex work in the county of Durham. Sustainable transformation regarding sexual exploitation and gender violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example, is likely to come through the refuge and rehabilitation provided by and for survivors of rape in Kinshasa, a programme supported by Mugisa Isangoma, the wife of the previous Archbishop of the Anglican Church in the Congo. This kind of sustainable transformation is likely to come about through real-world research, real-world resources, real-world leadership in and from the margins of real life, rather than, may I say, the recent appointment of Wonder Woman as a UN Honorary Ambassador for the Empowerment of Women and Girls. I'd suggest we don't need fictional heroes or comic book characters to inspire our daughters, or sons for that matter, to reflect the daily wonders carried out by women across the world. As powerful and effective as these examples of transformation may be, they are not, in the end, what is most persuasive for me. I'm coming to these conclusions about sustainable transformation from the margins as a model for the Kingdom of God because it is how I see God at work. I believe Jesus worked out our salvation, the most sustainable of transformation, by choosing to inhabit the most marginal place of all by choosing the Incarnation. The Incarnation is astonishing to me. That Jesus worked out our salvation from within our marginalised flesh. It never ceases to enthrall me that Jesus who, as we read in Philippians, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality of God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. That is extraordinary. That is life-changing for me, in theory and in practice, that God chose my flesh, not just to the point of marginalisation, but to dereliction on the cross. And then, out of that margin, transformed our alienation by re-establishing the hope of creation, the security of Sabbath, the generosity of Jubilee, the liberty of Exodus in the promise of the resurrection. Our recreation in Christ, the new Adam, 
offers the possibility of reimagining ourselves not as binary beings in perpetual conflict, but as glorious participants in God's wonderfully diverse creation. In such a reimagining, I think, we might find the security to trust the generosity of God's sufficiency again as an alternative to striving for control by hoarding our power. So what might this mean for us individually and collectively? I think perhaps it can lead us to recovering a biblical identity in mutually supportive, joyful relationships between embodied beings, aware of the goodness of creation, the reality of sin, and the possibility, the promise of recreation in Christ. It's all too easy to be deluded by our own sense of importance, to be seduced by the idols of our power and influence, to believe our own hype. With the best of intentions, we can collude with the fallen paradigm of centralising power and control, especially as we get closer to the centre ourselves and have increasing power to wield. But there is truth in the adage that power tends to corrupt. So we who are mighty need to be brought down from our thrones as much as those who are humble need to be lifted up. Not in a coup that simply reverses the abuse of power, but in ways that enable us to see each other face to face. I'm not sure that top-down centre-based solutions have much credibility in any circumstances, possibly emergency response, though that too at very least should benefit from post-event criticism from those intended to serve. But I am increasingly convinced that they do not produce sustainable transformation. So, the women in Kerala, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in County Durham, in Style Prison. What do they have to do with claims for Christ as the pattern of sustainable transformation? Well, a great deal, I think. Why should we be surprised if God chooses these margins? Margins where the need is greatest to carry out his recreative work in our generation. If solutions for the margins come from within the margins, what does this mean for those of us who do not live there? I think it means having the mind of Christ. I think it means following in Jesus' footsteps and choosing to work in ways that let go of our inherited models of power and control. I think it means making the magnific Magnificat our song too, allowing, choosing to let our thrones be vacated. I think it means realising that nothing is sustainably transformed which doesn't grow out of the new Adam. And self-giving, apparent defeat. I think it means wrestling with the possibility that what looks like worldly victory may in fact be loss, not transformation. A hollow win that leads to decay, not sustainability. I think it means acknowledging that all empires decay some quicker than others. But what lasts is a kingdom as small but disruptive as a mustard seed that has the capacity to go grow branches in which all the birds of the air can make their nests. 
I think it means that we at the centre, recognising that the periphery is a place that God has chosen to unfold his action of love in the world, that our task is to cooperate with the spirit who blows where it list and to approach only in humility with an open heart and open hands. Thank you.